Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I'm so excited today to have joining me best-selling author and end times expert, Bill Salas. Bill is the founder of Prophecy Depot Ministries. He's written 11 books and produced 14 DVDs. He's an author and speaker I've learned a lot from over the years, and I'm very glad to have him joining me today to discuss a very important prophetic event, the Psalm 83 War. Bill, thank you for joining me today. Hey, Jimmy, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, I've listened to you and read your books for many years, and you, you're you a scholar and you're a researcher, and that's one of the things I appreciate about your materials are very well thought out, very well, very well researched. Uh, you've written this book, uh, Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. Now, uh, we get a lot of questions about this here on the Tipping Point Show, and I just want to say right off the bat, if, if you're interested in the Psalm 83 war, we're going to be talking about it here today. This is a phenomenal book that gives you all the details about Psalm 83 and all the research that Bill has done. And I'm sure you can get this on Amazon.com. Bill, what is what is your website where people can go? Well, thank you, Jimmy. Yes, it's prophecydepot.com. Prophecy Depot, like Home Depot.com. Okay. okay, and all of your resources are available on there. Absolutely. Yeah, we have an online bookstore and DVD store, etc. So Psalm 83. We're going to talk in detail about this passage. The um, you believe that this is speaking of a war that has yet to take place. Is that correct? Oh, I do. That's what I teach. Um, I believe it is actually the climactic, concluding war that ends the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, land for peace deals have not been working. They're not biblically right. endorsed. Uh, but there's a plethora of prophecies that I believe are related to Psalm 83 that talk about war, that talk about Israel defeating its surrounding enemies, that share common borders with them, and all of them are listed in Psalm 83. So I do believe it's a coming war that has not found fulfillment yet. Well, Asaph, the Psalms are written by different people, uh, but Asaph wrote Psalm 83, and you believe that's significant, right? I do, because about 3,000 years ago, Asaph was a very close friend with King David. He was King David's worship leader. Matter of fact, they probably jammed together and did praise and worship on on the Sabbath, right? Yeah. And uh, he was a worship leader, but he was also a prophet. And at, at a time when he was, when the Jews were living large in the land, they David had his the anointed King David. They were going to build their temple. The reason they were living large in the land, we find out in First Chronicles 18 that David had conquered Philistia, which is where the Hamas are in the Gaza. Right. They had conquered Edom and Moab and Ammon. That's in modern-day Jordan today. We'll put a face on those modern-day equivalents today. They conquered up into Syria, and ancient Assyria. And then all of a sudden, Asaph comes out with this futuristic foretelling about the very countries and populations, territories and populations that David had just conquered and said, by the way, they're going to form a confederacy and try to wipe the nation of Israel off the map. The name of Israel will be remembered no more. So it was very peculiar that at that time he would come out with that prophecy. Now we find out that Asaph was a prophet in 2 Chronicles 29.30. We're told that moreover King Hezekiah and the leaders commanded the Levites to sing praise to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph, the seer, that means prophet, like Ezekiel or Jeremiah. Also, we're told in First Chronicles 25, 2, the sons of Asaph are under the direction of Asaph, who prophesied according to the order of the king. So he is a prophet, and he wrote 12 Psalms, Psalm 50 through, Psalm 73 through Psalm 83. The most prophetic of them is Psalm 83, and then subsequent, uh, secondarily would be Psalm 50. So I look at this as a very uh, relative prophecy for our time, Jimmy. So what is the plot? Uh, because these are, these are nations that immediately surround. Asaph is prophesying that basically the nations immediately surrounding Israel are going to try to snuff them out. Now, we, I mean, you, you can see that hatching as we speak. But so you believe that these are today, these uh, nations exist and do they have the motive? What's the plot behind all this? Right. Well, the psalm, the first five verses lays that out for us. It says, Asaph initially petitions God right off the bat in verse 1. Because of what he's about to foretell is so egregious, a, a, not a confrontation to wipe Israel off the map. He says to God, do not keep silent. Do not, be, do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. He's saying to God, listen, 
Do not keep silent. You have to have a response to what's about to happen. Do not hold your peace. You got to be ready for war and do not be still. You got to intervene. You got to be involved. And I point out in the Psalm 83 book and other prophecies that the, the Lord does intervene and he empowers the Israeli defense forces who exist in fulfillment of biblical prophecy today to wage and win the war against the Psalm 83 countries. And it goes on to say that your enemies make a tumult and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have craft, taken crafty counsel against your people, that would be Israel, the Jews, and against your sheltered ones. And they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. So what Asaph is saying, that the in the future, the countries we're about to reveal uh, would come together and form a devious plan to destroy the nation of Israel, to wipe the Israel off the map, and even take banish Israel from the future of all history books and past because they, that the name of Israel would be remembered no more. And we're going to find that this is not a uh, chronological assortment of Israel's enemies, but a contemporary group of modern day countries, which actually came to war against Israel in 1948, 1967, and 1973, but that, that did not fulfill the prophecy because the rest of the prophecy has to be fulfilled. And what, that, that's the plot. They want to destroy Israel. And we find out in Psalm 83, verse 12, the reason they want to destroy Israel and wipe it off the map is they want to take the promised land for their possession. They want the pastures of God for their possession. Right. So that's the plot. The participants are really important to figure out, well, who who is this confederacy? And we find out in verses, Psalm 83, verses 6 to 8, who they are. And, of course, he talks about them in their ancient names, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Gigabytes, Megabytes. <laughs> Although they didn't have Gigabytes and Megabytes <laughs> back then. Right? So we have, in the Psalm 83 book, we put forward faces uh, and maps as to who they are. But he says right in the beginning, he goes, the tents of Edom, uh, there's 10 member population. And the tents of Edom is the leads uh, participant. He says the Ishmaelites, that would be Saudi Arabia. I'll, I'll tell you who the tents of Edom are in just a minute in my estimation. Okay. Moab, that would be Central Jordan. The Hagarenes, that would be Egypt. Gabal, that would be Lebanon. Ammon, that would be Northern Jordan. Amalek would be down in the Sinai. Felicia, that's where the Hamas are in the Gaza. And the inhabitants of Tyre. So he's listed two populations so far in a habitation condition. The tents of Edom and the inhabitants of Tyre. Tyre would be in Lebanon, and that's where the Hezbollah hail from right now. Assyria has joined with them, and they have helped the children of Lot. So one of the members, Assyria, is actually helping the children of Lot, which is Jordan, Moab, and Ammon were the children of Lot. So there's, they're involved and in, integrated into actually helping another participant in the Confederacy. But the thing that's fascinating to me is he says the tents of Edom, he starts right off the bat. So whenever you see a, a member listed first in a, a confederacy, that's really significant. It's sort of like the star of a movie. When you see the, the, the credits at the end of the movie, the stars are listed first, then the cast and crew subsequently come rolling onto the screen. But he, calls, he says Edom is the star of this show, so to speak. But he puts them in a habitation condition, the tents of Edom. Tents represent biblically either military encampments or more prominently refugee conditions. Right. And the Edomites, as I trace through in my Psalm 83 book, have ethnical representation in the Palestinians today. Not all the Palestinians are of Edomite descent, but a majority of them are. And when we find them in a condition of refugee conditions, which happened as a result of the 1948 war, the tents of Edom became a reality when Israel came back in the land and the Arabs lost that 1948 war. And their plight is what's being bannered here, the Palestinian plight. They want a Palestinian state. They want to take the passage of God for possession so they can have another Arab state. And, of course, we see that there's our presidents and the international communities trying to right. broker two state solutions, et cetera. So I think we're watching this unfold in living, in living color in modern times, Jimmy. Well, you know, Bill, right now the United Nations had a select committee last week recommend that Israel be tried in an international criminal court at The Hague for their occupation of uh, Palestine, uh, Palestinian lands, beginning in 1967. This goes back to the invasion in 1967. And so this is a committee, but if the United Nations uh, passes this and they end up going to the International Criminal Court, of course, Israel's not gonna recommend whatever they do, but it could be, it could be the first step toward an invasion. So 
How do you see this all coming out? I mean, we know that God's going to supernaturally give the IDF the ability to protect Israel. How do you believe this thing is is going to take place? And what do we see right now that's leading toward that? Well, if you want my speculative scenario about what's on my radar screen, Jimmy, I would say basically what we're going to see happen is a sequence of events, prophetic events. One thing's going to happen probably in the near future, and it's going to lead to a succession of events on the heels of that event. And my, my suspicion is that Israel is going to strike Iran. And if they strike Iran, that's going to create a big issue because there's, Iran has proxies surrounding Israel, Hezbollah in Lebanon, with 150,000 missiles pointed at Israel. Some of those are precision guided, could hit within a 20 you know foot radius. With they could hit Tel Aviv, they could take out Ben Gurion Airport. They've got a bank of targets. You got Hamas down in the Gaza, right. who says we can match Hezbollah with, by lobbing at least a thousand missiles a day into Israel. You got Syria, who used chemical weapons over 300 times in their Syrian revolution with Bashar al-Assad there. Right. They could be lobbing chemical weapons into Israel. You got the Houthis down below Saudi Arabia, who uh, say they can also hit Tel Aviv with precision-guided missiles they've gotten from Iran. You got Shiite militias in Iraq. I believe that and the, an attack on Iran would be also prophetic as well, because there's two prophecies of Iran in the end times. One of them is in Ezekiel 38. Right. Ezekiel 38.5 is under the banner of Persia. Persia became Iran in 1935. It was renamed. But there's also a prophecy of Elam in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 34 through 39, which I believe actually precedes, and it's probably what we're talking about here. It seems like it's a nuclear prophecy. And, of course, Iran is on the fast track to get a nuclear weapon if they don't already have one. Right. They've been seizing the opportunity since Donald Trump withdrew from the JCPOA in 2018 to rapidly advance their nuclear program. And I think once they get struck, that's going to catalyze an event. And Israel is going to find itself in a prison rules war. They're going to be fighting for their life. Yeah. Weapons coming, missiles coming in from all sides. Iran just recently announced they have a hypersonic missile that can get to Israel in 400 seconds. Unbelievable. That's 6.66 .66 minutes, by the way. Wow. And they can hit the heart of Israel. And so, you know, this this is firepower that the Iron Dome can't. The Israeli defense systems are great, but they can't fend off no. the firepower that could be unleashed on them. And I think what happens at that point, Jimmy, is Israel lashes out and they destroy a city overnight. And I believe that would fulfill the city, the Isaiah 17 prophecy, the destruction of Damascus. Right. Damascus will cease from being a city. It'll become a ruin, a seep. We're told in Isaiah 17, Isaiah 17, 9 says, the desolation is caused by the children of Israel. And Isaiah 17, 14, concluding the prophecy says, in the morning you see him, speaking of Damascus and the masculine pronoun, but in the, eve in the evening you see him, but in the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who rob us and those who plunder us. And I think when that happens, Jimmy, if my scenario is correct, and I, I support it scripturally in my teachings. Uh, I think the Arab world will go up in an uproar because they just took out the oldest continuously inhabited city in recorded history, the capital of Syria, Damascus, and they're going to start. They're going to start saying in Lebanon, "What about Beirut? Are, are we next? What about Amman, Jordan? Are, are we next?" Which they are next, by the way. There's prophecies about Amman, Jordan that show Israel reducing it to rubble. Also, what about Cairo? In Egypt, what about Mecca and Saudi Arabia? And also, I think Isaiah 17 tells us that Israel does take a hit, and and Isaiah 17 verses four through six. So Israel has no option but to respond militarily for the survival of the nation. And I think when the Arab uproar happens, they say to themselves, "Our cities could be next." Yeah, Israel's hurt right now. This would be a time to come together. We can we can probably come together and take out Israel right now and so survive our cities and that sort of thing. And I think that would then lead to Psalm 83. So it's a, a succession of events, probably starting with Iran's nuclear program, Jeremiah 49, the Elon prophecy, probably leading to a proxy war where Damascus gets taken out as a city, probably leading to the Psalm 83 final Arab-Israeli Arab conflict. And that would conclude the Arab-Israeli conflict. Well, what you're saying, uh, I, I totally agree with every word of what you just said. 
the Is Israelis had a massive drill, I think this was last spring, called Chariots of Fire. And every branch of their military, uh, and some of this included the United States uh, Air Force, our military, they practiced bombing Iran. And the, there were two separate, uh, you know, things that they were doing. The first is they put $5 billion in their budget this year to bomb Iran. That's significant. The second thing is once they bomb Iran, the second part of Chariots of Fire was protecting their boundaries after they finished because they know exactly what you just said is going to happen. So this is not a fairy tale. This is happening. I mean, this is the Israelis are, are considering this right now. Another significant thing is Benjamin Netanyahu just got elected prime minister. And so we have a very ultra right wing government now, the newly elected government there in Israel. And if anyone would strike Iran preemptively, it would be Benjamin Netanyahu. But what you were saying, Bill, this a new part of this equation that's just, to me, just a couple of weeks old, is the hypersonic missile. That Iran begins to brag about being able to strike in 400 seconds, that's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. When you say that to Israel, they're already on edge. But when they when they have to consider six minutes, six point six six six, that they have to consider that type of strike, they have to at some point preemptively strike Iran. So I completely agree with what you just said. Now let's talk about how how does Israel, what does God do according to Psalm eighty three that gives the Israeli Defense Forces the ability to supernaturally defend their nation? Well, it's interesting because the prophecy goes on. See, some people think, first of all, I want to add a couple of things to what you just said, because what you just said was very telling. And there was, there's a part three in that chariots of fire drill that Israel did also, and they, they were preparing for casualties that would come upon them uh, inside of the country, aware of the fact that with the kind of firepower that could be launched against them that uh, they would likely experience casualties, especially concerns about chemical weapons and things like that coming through. Now, to get back to your question, um, ASAP, some people think that Psalm 83 was fulfilled in 1948, the War of 1948, the War of Independence, because the countries we listed that were, again, we're gonna go through those that were in Psalm 83 verses six to eight, you had Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the Palestinians would be there as the tents of Edom. You'd have the Gaza would be where the Hamas are today. Hezbollah is up in Lebanon. You know, these countries have Israel surrounded. I call them an inner circle of countries versus Ezekiel 38, which is a prophecy your, your, your listeners may be, or viewers may be familiar with, which deals with an outer ring of countries. None of the Psalm 83 countries that share common borders with Israel that have been Israel's notorious enemies. Right. None of them are in Ezekiel 38. I believe that's because they're dealt with prior in Psalm 83. Because why wouldn't they be? Why wouldn't they be in Ezekiel 38 when you have Iran involved? And Iran has its proxies. And the Ezekiel 38, if, if they're familiar with that prophecy or viewers, Russia's coming down with Turkey, Iran, and the coalition of nine to the uttermost parts of the north into the mountains of Israel from the north. And they'd have to go through Lebanon where Hezbollah is. Why would Hezbollah not be involved? Well, I think that's because Psalm 83 happens prior. But some, because the countries we just listed were involved in the 1948 war, some people think that was a fulfillment of the prophecy. But that takes us through Psalm 83, 1 through 8, not Psalm 83, 9 through 18, which says there's, there's all those extra verses we got to deal with in the psalm. And Asaph petitions God when he said, do not be still, do not hold your peace. Do not be silent, O God. He says, deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook of Cushan, who perished at Endor. And he goes through and talks about, he draws our attention to how he wants God to deal with the Arab enemies. And he draws our attention back to Judges chapters 4 through 8. And it's this historical precedent where God at that time, through the Deborah, Judges 4 and 5, the prophetess, the Canaanites had oppressed Israel for 20 years, she got her general Barak, and they went and defeated the Canaanites. They, they killed the king Jabin. Sisera was defeated. And the Canaanites never oppressed the Jews again. And then he draws our attention to Judges 6 through 8, where Gideon was involved with the 300-man army against the Midianites, who had oppressed the Jew Israel for, for seven years. 
uh, uh, pr plundered it and oppressed it. And Gideon said, God told Gideon, you're going to take stop this oppression. You're going to defeat them, their kings, their princes, Orb and Zeb, Zamuna, etc. And the Midianites were defeated, and they no longer ever oppressed Israel again. So we, we see that the Arab countries around Israel right now are still oppressing the Jews. Oh, yeah. This was not fulfilled. Well, so the the series of events that, that you're talking about, when you say that the Psalm 83 war is this ring of countries around Israel, you believe that then would lead to the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war soon thereafter. Is that right? I do. So let's, let's talk about a few prophecies that are unfulfilled that I think are about to happen. And I think they're border prophecies or peripheral prophecies of Psalm 83. Okay. We're told in Zechariah 12, verse 2, that behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling or dizziness in some translations unto all the people that are round about the inner circle when they lay siege of both, against both Judah and against Jerusalem. So someday, the Psalm 83 countries are going to make a final bid to take control of Jerusalem. You know, they, Jordan has control over the Temple Mount right now, which is a controversial thing because now with the right, religious right wing coming into yes uh into the coalition with benjamin netanyahu there's concerns that the status quo on the temple mount might change yes and if that happens jordan's going to be very concerned about that as are the palestinians half of jordan is filled with palestinians about five million palestinians about two and a half million of them are palestinian refugees and their holdout their hope is that they could control the temple mount which is the third holiest jerusalem's the third holiest city right. in islam but it goes on and says Someday they're going to lay siege upon it, and that's going to be a dramatic, a drastic mistake because it says in Zechariah 12 verse 6, the Israeli defense forces are going to take this to task. And here's what it says: In that day, in that day that the surrounding peoples lay siege on Judah and Jerusalem, I will make the captains or the IDF of Israel of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pile like a fiery torch in the sheaves, and they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Yes, Jerusalem. So we have a sort of a blanket prophecy with the Israeli Defense Forces defeating the people on the right hand and on the left hand of the surrounding countries that are part of Psalm 83 decisively, a fiery torch de devouring sheaves like kindling. I mean, there's a, no shortage of prophecies I put forward in the, the book about the Israeli Defense Forces winning wars. Here's one right here. So I told you that Jordan will be concerned if they see Damascus go up and, and right. smoke. Okay. Well, they should be because, and, and, and remember, Jordan has a fragile peace treaty with Israel right, right. now. Right. It's going to be threatened when the, the status quo changes on the Temple Mount. And we know the status quo is going to change on the Temple Mount someday yes. because the Jews will build a third temple. And that means they can't have the status quo the way it is right now. Right now, the Jews can't even go up and pray on the Temple Mount. They're not supposed to. So things are going to change eventually, and I believe that eventually is probably soon, maybe even 2023. But so Jordan, it says here about Jordan, This you don't find the peace treaty in these next two prophecies I'm going to tell you. And Jordan is listed in Psalm 83. Jeremiah 49, verse 2. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will cause to be heard an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites. That would be Ammon, Jordan. It shall be a desolate mound, and her villages shall be burned with fire. Then Israel shall take possession of its inheritance, says the Lord. So Israel is going to take that city down also. Now that Damascus to Amman, Jordan is not very far. I mean, you can drive there in just two, three or four hours. So, I mean, you know, Amman, Jordan is going to be reduced to rubble pretty much like as was Damascus. Zephaniah gives us a different camera angle on, the, I think, the very same prophecy. You know, these are unfulfilled prophecies, Jimmy, right. and they involve the Israeli Defense Forces. And for various reasons, time permitting, I can tell you why yeah. they will happen before the tribulation period. But I'll read this one here. And I mean, there's no shortage of the Israeli Defense Forces dealing with the Psalm 83 countries. This will be the, probably the last one I'll tell you about right now, and then we can get into the other questions. Zephaniah 2, verses 8 through 9. I have heard the reproach of Moab, that's central Jordan. And the insults of the people of Ammon, that's northern Jordan, which they have reproached against my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. But the residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. 
So what's going to happen is there's going to be a war. Israel is going to start annexing territory. They're going to take over. I can show you all the different scriptures. They're going to take over, in my estimation, all of Jordan. Wow. And and when Israel wins wars, they have a history of annexing territory. Joshua did it 3,300 years ago yeah. in the land of Canaan. King David and King Solomon did it 3,000 years ago. Israel did it in the 1967 war. It, they feel it's part of the promised land. It increases the defensibility of their borders. And when countries win wars, they often take over territory. Right. So, I mean, these are prophecies talking about Israel possessing Jordan, plundering and winning wars, taking out Damascus, taking out Amman, Jordan. I can get into the ones about Lebanon. I can get into the ones about Egypt and all that, too. But, you know, I think I think your viewers get the drift. Well, and like you said, if... I don't think it's a matter of if, when Israel strikes Iran, uh, because you were talking about Elam, and uh, Elam is there in, it's there in Iran, but it's also the nuclear area of Iran, where they have a lot of nuclear installations there. And so they, if they hit that, it's going to, the whole world's going to go crazy. Right. That prophecy is, to me, one of the most important ones to be watching. I have a book I wrote called Nuclear Showdown in Iran, yeah. revealing the ancient prophecy of Elam. And I get into that prophecy. You know, Elam is, uh, when you look at a modern day map of Iran, you have Persia, which is about two thirds of the country, mainly central and northern and southern. But west and west central is Elam and ancient territory. And they're always isolated from each other as far as territories by the Zagros Mountains. Right. Now, in e the Elam territory, they have all these underground missile silos and portable rocket launchers hidden there because that's the closest point from Iran to get to Israel. Right. Like they said they had missiles that could get there in eight minutes. Now they got hypersonic missiles, which can Iran is boasting cannot be detected and stopped by Israel's defense systems, they can get there in 6.66 .6 minutes, now 400 seconds. So they're boasting. But so that's a prime te territory to be attacked because that's where all the rocket launchers and missile, most of them are located there and buried underground. Also, you have the Bouchard nuclear reactor there, which is the crown jewel of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, that is uh, Bashar 1, it's right in the Elam territory. It's a nuclear disaster waiting to happen. It's built on three tectonic plates. Wow. And they have, they've had earthquakes there. They, there's, there's concerns about that. The, the Arabs across the Gulf who are rich in oil but are poor in water, they have two-thirds of the world's desalinization plants over there in the GCC countries of Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Qatar. They're very concerned about that disaster that could happen, whether it's an earthquake or an attack, because they've done a study after an earthquake, I think it was in 2013, they reported that due to wind patterns, that within, I think, 24 hours or so, they said, and I wish I had the quote in front of me, but 40% to 100% of the populations could be hurt, de devastated, because of the wind wow. patterns and the nuclear fallout coming across the Gulf. Wow. They said that only 10% of Tehran could be hurt because of those Zagros Mountains. The fallout would be blocked by those mountains. So, you know, we're talking about dynamics now that you're not hearing on the mainstream media or the, or the censored social networks. Right. This is this is a biblical narrative and prophetic perspective. Well, it's, very, it's, it's fascinating. Now, you believe that the Psalm 83 war is pre-tribulation, right? I do. And so let's talk about the Antichrist for just a minute because... The Antichrist is going to take the world stage then after the Psalm 83 war. And I also believe after Ezekiel 38 and 39. I believe those pretty much coincide. So you, the Antichrist is going to take opportunity, uh, kind of like after the Holocaust and the, the world has sympathy for Israel. Do you think that's what's going to happen after, after God takes the glory for this? I do, and I concur with you. I think there's sound reasons, especially with Psalm 83 and also with Ezekiel 38, to make them both pre-tribulation. I think there's sound reasons to sequence them Psalm 83 first, which enables Israel to dwell securely 
tear down the walls that they have on the borders around them. They've got walls to the north with Lebanon. They got a partition wall that's 400 plus miles in the middle of Israel that separates Palestinian stair terror from Israel proper. They got walls down around the Gaza. They got walls around Egypt separating. They got walls separating Jordan. And Ezekiel 38 talks about a time when Israel will dwell securely in the midst of the land without walls, bars, nor gates, and receipt of great plunder and booty, because that's what Russia comes after. And I don't think that Israel exists just yet, but it can exist when the people round about Israel right. that are going to lay siege upon Judah and Jerusalem are defeated. And so I, I see Psalm 83 happening, and I, I can explain why both of these prophecies, but especially Psalm 83, which involves the Israeli defense forces. Ezekiel 38 does not involve the Israeli right. defense forces. That's right. God stops that supernaturally with an earthquake. Every man, the enemies who speak foreign languages will start killing each other. They'll panic. There'll be fire, uh, great hailstones, flooding rains. Right. And, and God takes the glory for that. It says in Ezekiel 39, 7, after that happens. I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. They shall not profane my holy name anymore. The nation shall know I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel, which required two things. He said, my people Israel. Okay, well, that means the Jews couldn't have been destroyed in the Holocaust. They had to be brought right back into the land. Right. And that means that so many three Arabs can't destroy them also, because God has plans to make his holy name known through his people Israel. And they will say that the Holy One in Israel meaning they had to be a land of Israel. The Arabs can't be successful in Psalm 83 and take the pastures of God. Now, when it says the nation shall know I'm the Lord, I think it's to be uh, quite certain that the world is going to go, that was the God of the Jews. Now, that doesn't mean that they come to a salvation knowledge. Yeah. It would yeah. be nice if everyone in the world and all the Jews came to jump on the Jesus train, but I don't believe that's what's being said there. God is saying, look, and I think the timing is critical before the tribulation, before the Antichrist comes on the scene. God's saying, look, I'm the God who upholds the Abrahamic covenant. I'm the God who keeps the promises to the believers in Jesus Christ. Now, you can, you can choose me out. Look what I've just did. I've defended my Abrahamic covenant. I've kept the, my people Israel in the land. I've kept the promised land intact. In I've, I've stood behind it. My covenant to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Because pretty soon you can have on the nearby horizon, a guy coming on, a charismatic world leader, who's going to force you to worship him. So I want you guys to have the clear, clean choice now before that happens. Also, the other reason I don't think the church is here necessarily for Ezekiel 38 is because three times in Ezekiel 38, God calls this, the Jews, my people Israel. Really not, not a place for the church in that prophecy, so to speak. The Israeli Defense Forces winning wars against the Arabs there's a timing sequence we can figure out on that because they're not going to be fighting in the tribulation period. We've already ruled out they're not fighting Ezekiel 38, which could be just before the tribulation period. But they're not going to be fighting in the tribulation period because if you break the tribulation period down into its two compartments, you have a first half of three and a half years, you have a second half of three and a half years. And the first half, three and a half years, the, the Israel is feeling like they're living at peace because they've been involved in a a covenant, it's a false covenant, it's a pseudo peace because right. it's going to be broken in the mid part of the tribulation. But they're not going to be fighting wars against Arabs at that point. They're feeling like they're dwelling at peace. They got their temple on built, they're doing sacrifices and offerings, and they're not going to be waging wars against the Arabs. They, as a matter of fact, they're, they can't even stop the Antichrist at the mid part of the tribulation, right in the middle there, from going into the temple and stopping the sacrifices and offerings in fulfillment of Daniel 9:27. So then even Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 15 through 19, when you see the Antichrist, when you see the abomination of desolation being set up in the temple, which we just talked about happens in the mid part of the tribulation when the Antichrist goes in and desecrates the temple, he says, flee for your lives because he knows in Zechariah 13, 8, two-thirds of the Jews in the land will be cut off and killed because the Antichrist at that point is going to come out of the temple and commit a genocidal campaign against the Jewish people. So the, the Jews are going to be fleeing for their lives in the second half. If anything, they're going to pick, pick up a weapon on their way out and use it, not burn it for fuel or convert it to energy. Because, uh, and they certainly won't be fighting Arabs at that point either. Right. The wars with the IDF, and there's numerous ones, in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, I put those before the tribulation for those very purposes. I think that makes perfect sense. Bill, I want to thank you for joining me today. Now, let me say again, 
your book, Psalm 83. Now, Bill, Bill has lots of end times books. Psalm 83, The Missing Prophecy Revealed. And there's so much in this book. And you, you've hit the highlights here. Anything else you want to add to that, Bill? I just recently completed a Here to Eternity series, which goes from the now prophecies that could happen at the present time to the next prophecies that have some minor preconditions, to the last prophecies which happen in the first half of the tribulation, to the final prophecies which happen in the second half of the tribulation, to the millennium in the New Jerusalem. So we now have materials available through books and DVDs, a series that can take the reader from now on and through the tribulation on into forever. And of course, I don't I, I personally am a preacher of rapture believer, so I don't I don't believe every believer right now is be going through the tribulation, but there will be many people who get saved right. in the tribulation period. We find that out in numerous verses. So we have materials even that can be passed on to them so they'll know what's coming and how to survive that treacherous period. But I would say in closing, Jimmy, and again thank you for having me on your program. Okay. Um I think we need to realize that we're about at a time right now where Benjamin Netanyahu has to make, take action. Iran has got missiles now that can get to Israel in six minutes. They've got a nuclear program that is almost probably, if not already, has a nuclear weapon. Right. They want to wipe Israel off the map. They made that clear. I told Khomeini and said on numerous times, Israel is a cancerous tumor. His generals have said we want to take them off the global map. The proxies around Israel are hating Israel. I mean, I think we need to realize that coming into the new year with the new administration of Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, we could start to see biblical things start to happen. We could start to see biblical wars happen. It's been yeah. 74 years since uh, Israel became a nation. That was the last major fulfillment of biblical prophecies, but I think we got some coming right around the corner, Jimmy. That's, that's exciting. It really is. Well, Bill, Bill mentioned his books. I have all of your books. Really encourage you to go to...